uh, briefly, let's briefly start this session in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Father, into your hands we place this evening as we start another day, another session, another series this evening. We pray that all of us may uh, be enlightened by your Holy Spirit. O Spirit of Lord, open our hearts, our mind, and fill us with the spirit of understanding as your word, uh, as your word may now uh, produce fruit in our lives and also to share the word with uh, uh, more, more people. And we pray very special blessings upon Father Trevor as uh, he is leading this uh, series. Uh, let us pray that uh, also that the spirit may also uh, lead him and inspire him, fill him with his wisdom that every word he, he speaks may touch our hearts and change our hearts towards God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Over to you, Father. Good evening, friends. Good evening, brothers and sisters. Nice to be back with you once again. Um, as Joe's rightly pointed out, today we have a very, we are beginning a very exciting meditation on the seven words of Jesus on the cross. Let me give you a little introduction before we enter into the theme and the words, word itself. You know, whenever we visit a close friend or a relative or a dear one who has passed away, particularly at their funeral, or we go to pay a condolence to their family members. People always remember and they tend to recall the last words of the person who died. Right. These last words acquire new meaning and sense to their living especially those who are very close to the person who died. And I've seen this so often in the lives of so many people. In the same way, the early disciples of Jesus have recorded for us the last words of Jesus uttered while he was hanging and dying on the cross. In the midst of the acute pain and suffering, his acute agony on the cross, Jesus was still conscious. And the words that he uttered have a lasting meaning and significance, not only for those early disciples, but for each and every disciple present and those to come in the future as well. When we read these words, when we meditate upon these words, when we allow these words to become prayer, it's not merely an intellectual reading of these words. It's not merely studying these words, but these words are filled with a lots of emotion a lots of feeling, a lots of pain and suffering. And therefore, when Jesus uttered these words, we must put ourselves into that situation while he was hanging and dying on the cross, when he was experiencing that deep pain and suffering in his entire body, his entire mind, his entire spirit. To be crucified on the cross perhaps is the most humiliating and most painful experience that any human being can ever go through. And perhaps Jesus 
having faced that humiliating and painful experiences, we can only try to imagine what it feels like. We may only try to understand in some small measure what it means like the agony of Jesus on the cross. With one's hands and feet firmly nailed to the wood of the cross, besides the shooting pain, being unable to move, unable to even, you know, if you're uh, to do anything for yourself, the whole weight of your body resting on those nails. I just wonder to myself, whoever devised such punishment, what a kind of mind the person may have had. We never wish that any human being will ever go through such a kind of experience in their personal lives. My dear friends, today we are focusing on the first word of Jesus on the cross. But before I, before I begin this meditation, let me give you a little background, a little introduction. These seven words of Jesus are found in the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Not all the seven words are found in a single Gospel. Some are found in the Gospel of John. Some are found in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They are not in an ordered sequence. Only one word we know for sure it may have been the last words of Jesus when he said, it is finished. Or perhaps, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. All the other words would have been uttered at some point of time or the other on the cross. And therefore, we are not going by any chronological understanding, but we are taking these words as they come across to us, helping ourselves to understand what was happening to our Lord while he was hanging and dying on the cross. As I said a little earlier, this is a meditation. It is not really a Bible study in that sense. And therefore, I wish that every one of you who are listening to this presentation may also try to imbibe the spirit in which these words have been uttered by our Lord. The first word that I have chosen for this meditation today is taken from Mark chapter 15, verses 34. It will be useful if you have your Bible with you and if you can accompany me in reading these words as we go ahead. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabatini, which means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We find the same words also recorded by Matthew in chapter 27, verse 46. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabatini, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me?
My dear friends, this words are basically taken from Psalm number 22, verse 1. But we will come back to that a little later. What is the essence of these words? The essence of these words is this, a feeling of total abandonment, a feeling of total abandonment. Jesus on the cross, all the past memories are coming back flooding into his mind. He's remembering all the events that happened, recalling all the great things that God has done for his people, the people of Israel. How did God open the Red Sea? when they were faced between the devil and the deep, the army of Pharaoh and the Red Sea. In such a kind of situation, when the people of Israel cried out to God, Yahweh, Yahweh reached out to them and saved them. He divided the Red Sea so that they could go on dry land and were completely saved from the difficult situation that they found themselves in. And therefore, at this moment of time, Jesus feeling completely abandoned, a total abandonment. Let us look at the root meaning of this word. This word, the root meaning of this word, simply means to feel like you are completely abandoned, helpless, forsaken. You are just left in a dry desert without even a glass of water to quench your thirst. You're simply left to defend yourself and to survive for yourself. It is a feeling of complete abandonment, complete forsakenness. Two days ago, I happened to see a video on the YouTube somewhere. Someone had tied their dog, their pet dog to a tree in the interior remote place. And they had simply kept a bowl of food for the dog and had gone away, abandoned the dog, left the dog to defend itself. And the dog was so helpless, so defeated, This is the kind of situation that Jesus may have felt on the cross. At the time of his baptism, he heard those beautiful words, this is my beloved son. And now he was asking himself, Abba, Father, where are you? Where is my beloved father? Why have you abandoned me? Why have you forsaken me? Why have you gone away from me? Why do I not feel your loving presence? Jesus had three enemies with whom he was battling right from the beginning of his ministry. His whole aim and goal and purpose of life was the battlefield against these three enemies, Satan, sin, and death. His whole life struggle was a battle against these three enemies. And now on the cross, 
he could not allow himself to be defeated. This was the crucial moment for him. It was now that he needed God's strength and God's support more than at any other time in his life. But at such a kind of moment, he's feeling completely abandoned. He's feeling completely left alone to battle with the enemy by himself. Just imagine what may have been going on in the mind and the heart and the spirit of Jesus. The first enemy of his was Satan. Satan began challenging Jesus immediately after his baptism. You remember the incident after the baptism of Jesus, he was taken up to a high mountain. And there, while he was in 40 days of prayer and fasting, at the end of it, Satan began to challenge him. Satan began to confront him. Satan began to tease him, to poke fun at him, telling him, oh, are you the son of God? Come on, show us. Work some miracles for us. Turn these stones into bread. Bow down before me. I will give you everything that you ask for. He was being taunted, tempted, ridiculed. And now, very beautifully in that particular text there, you will read, the Satan left him for the time being, only to return again at the opportune time. And now on the cross, once again, Satan came to tempt him. Because this was the weakest moment in the life of Jesus. Completely helpless. Even the father had abandoned him so, so much he felt abandoned and helpless in himself. And therefore, this was really the beautiful opportunity for Satan to defeat Christ, to overcome him. And in this situation, Christ feeling that loneliness, feeling that helplessness, feeling that weakness is crying out to God above Father. Father, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? I can understand that my disciples abandoned me. I can, dis I can understand that my apostles abandoned me. I can, uh, I can understand that all the other people, my family members, the Pharisees, the Jews, and every other person who got benefits from me have abandoned me. But you, Abba Father, have you also abandoned me? So I feel within myself. I feel that I have been left alone to battle with the enemy. The second enemy of Christ is sin. We see this right coming from the, from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 1, verses 15, where Jesus speaks about repent from your sin and believe in the Gospel. And therefore, this became the first and the last sermon of Jesus. And this has been the sermon of the church ever since. Repent from your sin and believe in the gospel. Jesus said, I have come to save sinners, not the virtuous. I have come to save people like Zacchaeus, like the woman caught in adultery. I have come to save the prodigal son, the prodigal daughter. And now, the one 
who was supposed to bring back the lost sheep is feeling so lost and forsaken on the cross. The third enemy of Christ is death. And death, not merely physical death, but we are talking about eternal death. As the book of Romans so beautifully says, sin and death are interconnected with each other because the wages of sin is death. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. I take you back to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 3, verse 23. God had placed in the Garden of Eden the tree of life. And the tree of life was supposed to resemble the gift of life that God was giving humankind and all creation. But then, instead of obeying God's commands, humankind disobeyed God's command. And rather than choosing the fruits from the, from the tree of life, we reap the fruits from the tree of death. And ever since, the battle has begun. The first Adam transformed the tree of life to become the tree of death. And now Jesus hanging on the cross remembers that. It's a great challenge for him. In all obedience to to his God, Abba Father. He is now hanging on the cross and it is his responsibility now once again to transform the tree of death to become the tree of life once again. And St. Paul will refer to this. The cross, by the way, was also called the tree in the book of the Acts of the Apostles and in other scripture texts. And therefore, what was supposed to be the tree of death, the cross, Christ had to transform it to become the tree of life once again so that the book of Genesis could be reversed. The sin of Adam could be reversed and the folly of Adam could be reversed in order to make open the gates of paradise once again. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 25 to 26, we read, He must reign till he puts all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And therefore, this becomes important for us to understand because when Christ is dying on the cross, hanging on the cross, so many things are happening in his mind, in his heart, in his spirit. And he understands for himself that this is the great final battle that is taking place between him and Satan. And there is no way now that he can ever lose that battle. Because if he loses that battle, mankind is lost forever. And therefore, in that total emptiness, he's crying out to the Abba Father, Father, where are you? Where are you? I need you at this moment of time. I need your strength at this moment of time. My dear friends, if you want to have an experience, a little experience of what Jesus went on the cross, ask someone to tie your hands and feet and to place you close by to where the ants are there. 
spend only maybe five minutes and you will experience to some extent what Jesus was suffering on the cross. His hands nailed to the wood of the cross. His feet nailed to the wood of the cross. And now he is asked to fight the enemy with his hands and feet bound together. Have you ever seen a soldier in the, in the war fighting an enemy with hands and feet bound together? Have you seen a boxer in the rings fighting the enemy or fighting his opponent hands and feet bound together? He was completely helpless. Completely helpless. And to make matters worse, all the others around him were mocking at him, reviling him, fooling him, teasing him, abusing him. What did they say? Mark chapter 15, verses 29 to 30. Ha! You said that you would destroy the temple, right? And you're going to rebuild it up in three days. Now come down from the cross and let us see if you can build that temple down. Matthew chapter 27, verses 43. Didn't you say that you trust in God? Didn't you say that God is your father? Didn't you say that God will come and deliver you? Where is your God now? Where is your father now? You boasted about saying that you are the son of God. Now let us see your boasting. Christ had to go through tremendous ridicule, tremendous ignominy while on the cross. Hanging there alone on the cross, Jesus felt within himself that even Abba Father had abandoned him. The book of Psalms is full of verses which help us to understand what Jesus was going through on the cross. Psalm 22 in particular is a very precious psalm for us. If we want to understand what Jesus was going on the cross at that moment of time. In fact, the words of Jesus, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? are taken from Psalm number 22, verse 1. Jesus knew the Psalms very well. And this was his final prayer to God. His final lamentation to God. In his total abandonment, total isolation, it was the lamentation, the cry, the agony of the suffering servant of Yahweh. It would be worthwhile, brothers and sisters, for you at some point of time to quietly read and reread Psalm number 22.1. I just highlight a few verses for us this evening. How did Jesus feel on the cross? Psalm 22, verse 6. I feel like a worm and not a man. I am scorned and despised by men and by the people around me. Verse seven, they are mocking me. They are wagging their heads at me. Verse number 12, I feel that I have been surrounded by so many bulls, strong bulls of Basha, and they're opening their mouths at me and threatening me. I feel like there's a lion around me. 
roaring and waiting to devour me. Verse number 16, I feel that I am surrounded by dogs. Evil doers are encircling me. Verse number 15, I feel like a dried up piece of clay. I feel like a dried up piece of clay. My tongue is cleaving to my jaws. I'm not even able to utter the words from my mouth. And I'm lying in the dust of death. Amazing poetry, amazing words reflected now in the person of Jesus hanging on the cross. Verse number 19. Oh Lord, do not be far away from me. You were my help all this time. You always came to my aid, my help. Now I'm crying out to you. Please come and help me. Come and deliver my soul from the sword. Let my life, save my life from the power of the dogs. Can you imagine, my dear brothers and sisters, what was going through the spirit of Jesus? The kind of emptiness. We find a similar kind of emotions, sentiments in Psalm number 9, verses 9 to 10. Those who know thy name put their trust in thee, for thou hast not forsaken thee who seek thee. Jesus knew this psalm. He prayed these psalms. And he, he knew that God would always be with him in full confidence. But now he felt that Psalm number nine does not exist. He feels that Psalm number nine is an empty words that he prayed all these days. How can I make a response of the Psalm and Jesus my own? Just think about it, brothers and sisters. If you and I were to face similar situations in life, how are we going to make the psalmist prayer our own? What will be my response if I'm put in a similar situation like that of Jesus? Will I be angry with God? Will I be disappointed with God? Will I be depressed with God? Will I be bitter with him? Will I run away from him? Will I leave him? Quite often I come across people telling me, where was God when I needed him most? Why didn't he help me? And I felt so angry with God. And some people even went to the extent of cursing God of abusing God. And now in that abandonment, Jesus is facing a very tremendous situation. How is he going to respond to God above Father? Psalm number 27, 8 to 10. Psalm number 27, 8 to 10. The psalmist says, seek your face. My heart says, your face, O Lord, I am seeking day and night. Hide not your face from me. Turn not from your servant away in anger, but come to my help. These are the words that were coming perhaps into the heart and mind of Jesus. Where is your face, Abba Father? Show me your face for a little while, just a glimpse of your face, so that I may have the courage and strength to carry on this journey on the cross. I may have the ability to bear this pain and suffering and mockery and ignore me on the cross. Do not hide your face from me, Abba Father. Psalm number 71, 8 to 15. Psalm number 71, 8 to 15. 
Do not cast me off in my old age. Do not forsake me when my strength is spent. Let them not say, let my enemies not say that God has forsaken him. Let them not make fun of me that God has forsaken him. O oh God, be not far away from me. O oh God, make haste to help me. My dear friends, we cannot get more beautiful words than these in the Psalms. And every Psalm is a cry coming from the heart and the depth of Jesus' spirit. Now you can understand the book of Psalms in the light of the words of Jesus on the cross. These are not empty words. These are words filled and packed with emotions, with suffering, with pain, with agony, with abandonment. Psalm number 88. I am reckoned as one who has to go down into the pit. I am a man who has no more strength. I am a forsaken like the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those who are never remembered again in their life. I am cut off from the land of the living. My dear friends, something for all of us to think about. But did God really abandon Jesus on the cross? I'd like to take you to Isaiah chapter 49, verses 14 to 16. Isaiah chapter 49, verses 14 to 16. There was a time in the life of the people of Israel where they began to feel the same as Jesus was feeling on the cross. They thought that God had abandoned them, forsaken them, forgotten them. And therefore Zion cries out, the Lord has forsaken me, the Lord has forgotten me. And then the prophet Isaiah reminds them, can a mother forget a baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though a mother may forget her child at her breast, I, Yahweh, I, Abba Father, will not, will not forget you. Why? Because I have carved you, I have engraved you, I have tattooed you, I have branded you on the palm of my hands. And every time I look at my palm of my hands, I see your face and I will never ever abandon you. And therefore, do not feel discouraged. Do not feel lost. Do not feel abandoned. Do not feel forgotten. My dear brothers and sisters, these words also perhaps pass through the mind and heart and spirit of Jesus on the cross. Because if these words had not been in his mind and heart and spirit, perhaps the cross would have been his defeat and his greatest failure. The image used here is down to earth. We all know what it means for a woman to carry a child at her breast. And the woman is always attentive. The mother is always attentive to the cry of her child. Even if there is so much of noise around the place, the woman, the mother can identify the cry, the, even the silent cry of the child. And the mother knows exactly 
what the child needs just by listening to that cry. And therefore the prophet Isaiah is using a very powerful image to convey to us that if our human mothers can be so attentive, so loving, so caring, so concerned, how much more God is loving and caring and concerned for each and every one of us, and particularly his most beloved son, Jesus Christ, when he's on the cross. I have inscribed you, I have carved you on the palm of my hands. I have made you part of my flesh and my blood. I cannot forget you. I will not forget you. My dear friends, I leave you with the last questions. Have any of us faced similar situations in our life when we feel totally abandoned by God, left to defend ourselves? I'm sure, yes, we do. And many of us go through such kind of defeating, abandoning, lost situations of our life, maybe in sickness, maybe in our married lives, maybe in our family lives, maybe in our workplaces, so many circumstances of life. We feel sometimes that God has forgotten us. In such a situation, my dear friends, what is going to be my response? How am I going to respond to it? This evening, I'm inviting each and every one of you, including myself. Let us make the words of Jesus our own words. Let us make the Psalm 22, the prayer of our heart, when we feel such abandonment, when we feel such loss, when we feel completely forgotten by God. Let us make the words of Isaiah 49, the words to memorize and remember and pray every day in our life. Do not go searching for prayer books, my dear friends. There are plenty and plenty of passages in the scriptures that I give you prayer for all the days of your life. Make this words your own prayer every morning, every evening in your homes and your families. Can a mother forget her baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Even though she may forget, I will never forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. Remember the last words of Jesus before he ascended into heaven. Do not be afraid. I am with you till the end of time. Even though I feel abandoned, God never, never, never abandons us. Jose, over to you. Thank you, Father. It was very, uh, you know, very, very captivating. It's, uh, you took us through beautifully the, uh, you know, the first part of the session. Father, I wanted to ask you this question. Now, you said there are three enemies for God, for Jesus, devil, sin, and death. Right? That's what you said. Right. Now, this uh, sin and sins, uh, how do, what is the right uh, thing, Father? You know, sometimes uh, in, in the Gospel of John, we uh, read it as sin of the world, Lamb of God who take away the sin of yeah. the world. And, this, uh, you know, and also we sometimes pray that, uh, uh, you know, take away the sins of the world, which is the right thing. And what is the difference? Uh, if sin is the singular, which is equivalent to devil, is that what it means? No. You see, uh, sin is a representation of all that is opposed to God. Mm -hmm. So, we use the word sins for our understanding that we have committed 
many, many okay. actions okay. or deeds that are opposing to God. Okay. But basically, there is only one sin. Sin. Sin is a composite of everything that offends God. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the more right word is sin rather than sins. Sins. Okay. Sin. So we say that Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Sin of the world. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You know, because sin is an encompassing uh, reality. Okay. So it's that an is encompassing our, word. That is our action, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, based on disobedience. Yeah. If so. you want to put it this way, it's a totality of all the actions of all human beings put together is sin. Sin. Oh, okay. 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 Mm -hmm. Then I could say my sins. Oh, okay. That is more, to, that is to de denote, uh, you know, the number of uh, times or number of yeah. different types. Right. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So what Jesus, the enemy of Jesus is not sins, but sin. Mm -hmm. The totality of, you know, that sinful behavior of the total human race. Okay, so in the, the in the during the mass we say Lamb of God who take away the sin of the sin world. of the world, ah. sin of the world. <laughs> okay, yeah. good, good, good. So the devil, yeah, sin and the death. Okay, the the death is uh, death is a result of the sin of the human. The wages of sin is death. Ah. Here we must understand very clearly. You see, uh, go back to the Garden of Eden ah. when Adam and Eve were given the gift of life. Mm. And it was not simply human life, but it was eternal life. Correct. Okay. Now, with the disobedience of the of our first parents, now we have lost that right to eternal life. Mm. And that is why now, uh, here death is to be understood not in terms of my human death, mm. but in terms of eternal death. Mm. You see. So the other words for this are common words that we use are like heaven and hell. Mm -hmm. You know, so heaven would mean eternal life. Hell would mean eternal death mm -hmm. in that sense. Okay. okay. Any, any questions on uh, what the father has shared uh, today? Any questions, any comments, yeah. any opinions? <laughs> opinions. Yes. So it was. Uh, I think so, you need to unmute them, Jos. Yeah, yeah, I have unmuted. I have unmuted. Yeah, people liked it. People are putting the hearts. It's a very good uh, meditation for us to, you know, go through this. Uh, so this, uh, so Jesus was uh, referring to a lot of times Psalms, uh, you know, right, Father? Oh yes, oh yes. One of the things that we should remember very clearly is the, the Psalms have been a very old prayer of the Jewish community. You see? And Jesus, when he went to the temple, would surely have prayed the Psalms. Mm. And that is why, even in the, uh, St. Paul will speak about, you know, sing Psalms and hymns. He uses the word Psalms there. Yeah. And in the early Christian community, it is most likely that they continued the Jewish tradition of saying Psalms. Mm. And that is why, for example, in the Catholic Church, even till today, we have the book of Psalms given to priests and uh, deacons and bishops, which is considered to be part of our daily activity, mm. to say the Psalms seven times a day. Yeah. So the 150 Psalms are divided into four weeks, and all the Psalms are so arranged that we can do the cycle of 150 psalms every week, mm -hmm. every four weeks. Okay. Every four weeks, yes. What is it? Uh, what is it called, Father? What is it's, that? Uh... It's, it's called as the office, the divine office. Okay. Or okay. more popularly, it is called as the breviary. Uh -huh. And just for the sake of your listeners, uh, those of you who would like to participate and actually use the psalms for your personal prayer, uh -huh. there are apps available today. Okay. in which you can download the app and use that uh, the, the Psalms for your personal prayer. Maybe at another occasion, uh, we could have a whole session and teach you how to pray the breviary. Oh, that would be good. That would be wonderful. Yes. yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you, Father. Any other comments anybody else uh, would like to share? Okay. Looks like uh, everyone is uh, in that uh, mode of uh, reflection. <laughs> So, Father, so can we, uh, uh, you know, wait for your blessing, Father? Yeah, sure. God, our Father, we praise you, we glorify you, we adore you, we worship you, we bless you, we thank you. Together with your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and your most Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for your Son climbing the cross, carrying with him our pain, our suffering, our sin, our death, our disobedience, and the punishment that was due to every one of us. Father, we thank you for leaving us a record of the seven last words of Jesus on the cross. Words which sound so simple, but words which are so profound, so deep, so agonizing, so enriching. We ask you, Abba Father, today, and we are praying in a very special way for everyone who feels so abandoned, so lost, so forgotten in their personal lives. We are praying for people who are suffering from violence, people who are suffering from all kinds of injustices. People who are not getting their due reward or their dues in spite of being honest, in spite of their prayerful, prayerfulness, in spite of everything that they are, they can do. We ask you, Father, to fill them, to instill in them your hope, the hope that you spoke to us with the prophet Isaiah. Even if a mother forgets her child at her breast, I will never forget you. Father, we thank you immensely this evening for each and every one of us who have gathered here to listen to your word, to meditate on your word, and to make your word our prayer, the prayer of our hearts and the prayer of our life. We ask you to bless Joe's, his family, and the organizers, happy families, for conducting these programs and making these available for hundreds of people around the globe so that your people may be strengthened in faith and grow deeper in their relationship with you, God, Abba, Father, with your son, Jesus, and your most Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And may Almighty God bless us, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you, you, brothers and sisters. Thank you, Father. Thank you very much. Thank you, Father. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Do send us your feedback. Thank you, Father. Do send us your feedback. We'll be very happy to listen yes, to your sure, feedback. Father. Your comments. Thank you, Father. Yeah. Join us tomorrow. Tomorrow we have the second word of Jesus on the cross. So kindly invite your friends and others to join in tomorrow, same time, and to participate in these meditations. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.